Uh, my name is Father Scott Woods. Um, I'm the pastor here at St. Cecilia's, the pastor of St. Peter Claver's, uh, chaplain to the Catholic community at St. Mary's uh, College, as well as uh, chaplain to St. Mary's Riken and assistant vocation director for the Archdiocese of Washington. Um, I had a very normal childhood. Uh, I grew up, uh, for eight years, I was uh, an only child. Um, my family tells me that um, even though they were Catholic, uh, from the age of three, uh, I was already talking about being a Catholic priest, which surprised them since we had no, no close relatives really that were Catholic, and that, uh, of course, I was only three years old. But it never left me. It continued to grow uh, within me. That there was nothing else I, that really attracted me as much as the priesthood. I really started to encounter Catholicism when I was in the first grade. I went to Our Lady of Sorrows uh, Catholic School, and I remember there the going to a Mass and coming out and coming down the steps. I can still see it. And I saw this priest to the side, and immediately what came into my mind, deeply into my heart, was that's what I wanted to be. That was, in fact, what I was supposed to be. And it just never left me. The uh, experience was so powerful that I would tell everyone I was going to be a priest, even though I wasn't even Catholic yet. When we moved uh, to D.C., the, uh, the desire to grow closer to God kept growing stronger. My, I went to Catholic high school, Archbishop Carroll, and the freshman year there, I found out there was a daily mass. I started waking up early, which shocked my parents. That I, and then I would go to daily mass, and that's when my parents said, okay, he's serious about this, so we're gonna let him convert. So my dad took me to the local Catholic parish, where in fact he had gone as a child with his Catholic friends, even though he wasn't Catholic. And this parish, uh, they, they didn't have a, a, a a group for someone my age, so they put me with the adults, which was actually perfect because I was very precocious anyway. And uh, it, it, I really sucked it all in. And the more I learned, the more I loved the faith, and the more that this desire for the priesthood kept growing. When it comes to my conversion, I would say that it really started in a deeper level when I was in middle school. I experienced this interior voice that kept saying to me, my will or your will, my will or your will. It wouldn't leave me. And I thought maybe I was going crazy, so I wouldn't tell my parents or any of my friends. But it grew stronger. And eventually I, I came to realize that it really was the voice of the Lord. And I really knew that it was, that if I followed His will, it would lead me to priesthood in my, in my vocation. And at that point, you know, liking girls and thinking of marriage and family, I just really was not willing to say yes yet. And then it hit me that, well, who would know better what would make me happy than this God whom I, I was already beginning to love and to know in prayer. And so I remember the night I finally said, Lord, how can I resist you? Of course, I'll, I'll do your will. And it was the first time in my life I, I experienced a profound peace far beyond anything I had ever experienced before that really was confirming for me that this was the Lord and this is what he desired me to do. And so uh, going to daily mass at my high school, I really came to fall in love with the Eucharist and uh, more and more I desired to receive our Lord. I was going to daily Mass and could not receive Him. And uh, as I went through RCIA, I, I just really desired to become Catholic and, and really desired to receive the sacraments. And finally that was fulfilled uh, now 20 years, a little about 20 years ago, over, over 20 years ago, 30 years ago uh, now, I, that happened where I was able to finally at uh, the Easter Vigil receive our Lord in Holy Communion. And before that, a little before that, go to my first reconciliation. And then of course the Sacrament of Confirmation. And those are some of the, one of the happiest days of my entire life. When I was in high school, I was uh, dating my first year, a really wonderful young woman. Um, it, it, the Lord just really brought in my heart again that he wanted me to be his priest and that uh, that he wanted me to already start to prepare. And so at the end of that relationship, at the end of that year, we, we broke up. And uh, the desire for uh, the priesthood kept growing stronger. I was volunteering to help with uh, kids' programs and very active in my parish as an altar server and sacristan and involved a little bit in the youth group. Uh, but it, it really kept growing that I desired to give my whole self to the Lord. And so by senior year, I started talking with a chaplain. He got me in contact with the vocation director. And the vocation director uh, started meeting with me and, and then took me for a visit to the seminary, which I thought would be like more like a monastery. I imagine they would all just be praying all day and 
and studying deeply and I just thought I was going to have to you know, red knuckle it through there and found they were very normal guys to my to my joy. They they weren't perfect and they weren't uh, weird. They were like normal guys who but who sought holiness in life and who desired to do God's will wherever it would lead them. And that going to seminary wasn't it wasn't a slam dunk that you'd be a priest. In fact, many of the guys did discern out, discern that they were called to marriage. But they were all happy for their time in seminary because they realized they came out as better men better prepared for marriage and for family life. And so it was a blessing to grow uh, with these men. I found I was being more shaped through these relationships with my brothers in the seminary than even by the faculty. It was a wonderful eight years, four years of college seminary in Scranton, PA, and four years of major seminary, going to a regular uh, college, the University of Scranton, which was a, a Jesuit college, uh, but living at the seminary, being formed uh, through prayer and through learning the spiritual life. It really, I would say my freshman year of college seminary, there were three really, really good men who were uh, seniors and they had a very strong effect on me because they were so filled with joy and peace. And I said, I want what they have. And what did they have? They had a profound relationship with our Lord, uh, one that drew them into a place where they weren't so easily influenced by the ups and downs of the emotions of everyone else. And I said, I want that. And, and I, so I started hanging out with them, and, and they really led me to uh, see the, necess the necessity of having a, a stronger relationship through a holy hour every, every day, if possible, an hour before the Lord and the Eucharist, even if not exposed, uh, to praying the rosary, the deeper devotion to Our Lady, a deeper devotion to the lives of the saints, uh, reading some of the mystics like John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila that really inspired me uh, to, to what was possible. I think I used to think that only certain special people get to really be close to Jesus. And I discovered, no, Jesus sees every one of us as massively special as, as and desires a deep, intimate relationship with us that's transforming and, and reforming and building and, and beautiful. Definitely I've seen my spiritual life change. I, I think I'm much more in love with our Lord than ever before. Before, a lot of my prayer was, was talking to the Lord. Much more now, I just, I just bask in the light of His love and mercy, and goodness and truth, and with no, very little desire to say much of anything. A greater and greater desire just to spend time with Him. But more than anything, I know He has a great desire to spend time with me. Um, and not just in the chapel, but what I'm doing, regular, everyday task, that the Lord is present. So my awareness of His presence and His goodness and His love for me and for others, even the ones I find difficult, has definitely grown so much. And that I can love them by first receiving His love. And that He helps me to see them as He sees, as he sees me and he, as He sees them. And that's transformed even my relationships with family members especially some of the more difficult ones, <laughs> and with uh, people in the parish who I can find that their personalities are very different than mine or their way of, you know, maybe I wouldn't appreciate them naturally so much, but God has helped me to see them in a different light uh, because of the way in which I've allowed him more deeply into my own heart. So my first assignment was St. John Neumann in Gaithersburg, which was a dream parish. It was... Uh, 1,700 families, two priests, but a huge staff, all of whom were on the same page. Um, uh, thriving parish, perpetual adoration, a youth group with over 100 kids, uh, two schools, and uh, lots of young adults and young families. And I felt embraced and loved. Uh, and, and this was so amazing, especially uh, because it was 2002, after the year when all the scandals had hit. And I wasn't sure how people would react to a young priest. And they were so welcoming, so loving. It, it, it really shaped me in my priesthood. And then I had an amazing pastor who was just this good, humble, holy man of God, who's now one of our auxiliary bishops, Bishop Fisher, and was so very, very patient with me. And um, it, it shaped me so much. They told me, we're sending you down to uh, St. Mary's City and to Ridge, Maryland. And years ago, as a seminarian, I had visited this area. and. I grew up in the city, so I just remember looking around going, God never, ever sent me down here. And this is where I was being sent to the exact two parishes I didn't want to go. And I told the vicar general, who by this point, or the vicar clergy, who at this point was my first pastor, I said, I don't think I belong there. And he said, well, God and the Cardinal do. 
Oh, that's it. Okay, then I'm going. But my best friend is a good holy priest. This is why it's so good to have friends who support you in your faith and who speak to you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. My best friend, who's a priest of Arlington, said, Scott, I said, I'm going to go down there, I'm going to hate it, I'm going to be miserable. He said, no, you're going to go down there, you're going to give everything to the Lord, and within a short time, you're going to fall in love, and you're going to cry your eyes out when you have to leave. And I thought to myself, never. And within the first week, I called and said, you're right, I love this place. The people are awesome, the place is so beautiful. And it really taught me again a lesson that the Lord knows exactly what He's doing, and that um, I have to be willing to throw myself um, into his arms, very much like a child, kind of letting go of the jungle gym bars. I have to be willing to just let go and let God. And that if I do, he will bless me in ways and, and through me bless others that I could never imagine. That's exactly what's happened. Even as the job started to stack up, you know, first I get here of two parishes in the college. I never ministered to college students and not do that. Um, then I became assistant vocation director, helping their, with guys who are discerning priesthood and young women in religious life. And then uh, a high school on top of that. And, I, and again, I started complaining about the multitasking. The Lord again reminded me, I give you these things so you learn to trust in me. So that you learn that it's not about what you have, but who you have, which is me. And when you have me, you have everything. And that really is a message for us all. You know, when we have Christ, we have everything. Everything that is necessary. So what is it about the priesthood that I love the most? Uh, certainly I would say it's, it's the offering of the Holy Sacrifice the Mass. And every morning I wake up and that's, the, that's what I look forward to the most, uh, is offering the Mass. Uh, to, to hold our Lord in my hands, to know that this bread in my hands is being transformed at the words that I'm speaking uh, into the body and blood of the soul and divinity of the Savior of the world, of God, is the most extraordinary thing in the world. Certainly after that would be, next with it, would be uh, confessions. Uh, to be able to offer God's mercy, to know that the blood of Christ is being poured down on the person who I'm praying that, that praying over their words of absolution. And of course I love receiving that sacrament from my brother priests who are good friends of mine. And then uh, spiritual direction. It, uh, really it's confession, spiritual direction that I feared the most, as well as preaching homilies and giving talks. Uh, because I knew so much of those things depended on, on me to a certain extent. I had seen other priests who were brilliant at it and thought I would be horrible. Again, looking at myself, not at Jesus. And one of the things I do more than anything else, hear confessions and spiritual direction. And uh, our Lord has said to me a number of times that that's exactly what he gave me because then again, I would, I would always be brought back to have to trust in him. And not just trust in him, but learn to really trust in his love and in his confidence in me that he also puts confidence in us um, where we otherwise wouldn't and he and he's right there like the father or, or you know teaching us how to, how to ride a bike I just been amazed at the experience uh, so powerfully his presence when ministering to others uh, particularly in spiritual action uh, there are times people bring me things, and I'm like, oh my goodness, what in the world am I going to say? I don't know what to say, and the Lord's always right there. Yes, but I do. <laughs> you know? So just trust in me, just walk with me. So that's that's been uh, some of the greatest blessings of the priesthood. So the question being, uh, what, if there's one thing you could learn from my life, what would it be? Uh, I really think, again, that, just, that our God is a God full of surprises. We make our plans, but His plans are greater and more amazing, and more beautiful, and more wonderful, and joyful, and peaceful, and fulfilling than we could ever imagine, or have planned, or make possible. Here I am, uh, a kid who grew up uh, kind of Episcopalian slash Baptist, and now I'm a Catholic priest, having received that call at the age of three. Uh, all the twists and turns of my story, and the, and the ways in which God has worked through it, despite my failures and my sinfulness and my brokenness and my wounds he's been able to do things to me I never could have imagined and that's all it's required of me is a willingness a willingness to trust in him and a willingness to be moved by him even to places and in, in, in particular ministries I would never have chosen myself and the ones those have been the best those have been the, the greatest those have been the ones that have been most fruitful
the places that I thought would be most arid, most dry, most uh, scary, that I was most afraid of. And it stretched me the most, but it's also been the greatest of blessings. And so I hope if there's anything you can learn, it's to really trust in Him, to really open your heart to Him, and to let Him move you in whatever way He wants, to wherever He wants. That's where happiness will be found. That's where you will be most fulfilled. And that's where joy will flow.